Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Jesse here. It's such a blessing to know that so many of you are out there enjoying our YouTube videos. Thank you for doing that. Now, you don't want to miss anything, so like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell. Why? So you will know every time we post new content. That's like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Pretty simple, isn't it? Now, watch this. But we're, tonight is the message, uh, the parable of Jesus message series, part four, and the title of it is The Two Debtors. The Two Debtors. You may have heard of this one. We're going to turn to Luke chapter seven. Luke chapter seven. That's just one more chapter over from where we were for the offering teaching. Making it a little easy for you tonight. Sometimes I have you flipping all over the Bible, but tonight we're going to stay in one place and we're going to use the King James Bible. Just as a quick review, y'all know I like to do that. Uh, about one-third of Jesus' teachings was in parables. And these were stories from everyday life to illustrate spiritual truths. And these were like word pictures that made truths come alive in the minds of those that heard him. And he was able to help them to understand things. And some of them got it and some of them didn't. But these word pictures really made a difference. Amen? Y'all know about word pictures, right? If somebody explains something, it, in a, in a, sometimes it goes right over your head. But if you stop and you tell a story, well, let me tell you about that, this buffet that I went to. You start talking about food, everybody's eyes light up. You know, and, and how beautiful it was, the display was. And it's a story, and it, it's just a way to get attention. But in this series, we've already studied eight powerful parables of Jesus. All of them were from one chapter, Matthew chapter 13. And those eight, eight parables are also recorded in the Gospel of Luke. But the Gospel of Luke is actually the longest book in the New Testament, and it was compiled from eyewitness accounts. And Luke has a lot of great insight into the life and the teachings of Jesus. And he comes at it from a perspective of a doctor who really paid attention to details, especially when he was recording the details about Jesus' crucifixion and the details about how that all, how the body interacted. Some of the things he observed and wrote down were a little different than some others. He also, because he was a doctor, with the, with the healings that were recorded were so powerful. But he has a lot of insight, and it includes... 35 of the Lord's parables in this Gospel of Luke, and 19 of these parables that Luke records are unique only to his Gospel. The parable of the two debtors is one of those unique parables that we're going to study tonight. It's only found in Luke. And this was actually the first parable that was recorded in this Gospel. You see how I like order? I like to have things have a purpose and I hope y'all, I'm not boring you with all these little details, but they feed me, so this is how I feed you. Is that okay? Yeah. And this whole parable of the debtors is really only two verses, but it's so significant. And we're going to read the verses surrounding this parable that Jesus taught to understand the lesson that he wanted people to learn that day, and what he wants to, for us to learn as well. So we're going to read Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. Say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> verse 36, and we're going to go all the way to the end of the chapter. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner... When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man... If he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence 
and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gave me, gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil this not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth much, she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that, that forgiveth sins also? And he said unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Such a powerful story. Such, it should just search our own soul and realize where are we at right now in this story this occur event occurred while Jesus was in the city of Nain. And it was a home of a Pharisee named Simon, which was a very common name of that day. And uh, not to be confused with the Simon home where Mary Magdalene, excuse me, Mary and Martha and Lazarus uh, had a similar story. It's a totally different story. But in this home of the Pharisee, uh, a lot, something very strong happened that day. And this Luke uh, tells us so much about how Jesus interacted with the Pharisees of his day, but not all of them were antagonistic. Some were interested in his teaching and just, or some of them were just curious. You know, you remember Nicodemus? He was a Pharisee that treated Jesus kindly. Also, Joseph of Arimathea, both of those together after Jesus was crucified, uh, took care of the body of Jesus. They had great risk to themselves because there was a lot of opposition at that time. So there were some Pharisees who were cruel and mean and, and harsh, but there were some that were not. It just, at that day, we think, we hear the word Pharisee and we think, ooh, you know, you hear like the organ, duh, 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 you know. In your head, maybe you do, I do. But that was a good thing in those days. They were very respected. They weren't, uh, some were bad, of course, but they're like, they were uh, had well thought of in that day. So this was not the same event that occurred in the home of Simon of Bethany, because that was in Bethany. This was in Nain. But this was also not Mary, that beautiful woman who sat at the feet of Jesus. So this, they had similar, similar stories, but differences. But this woman was a well-known sinner, and uh, the implication in this teaching is that she was actually a prostitute. So the Pharisees showed nothing but contempt for sinners, and this was clear in the story. Simon was convinced that if Jesus knew her character, he would have sent her away. That's what he thought to himself. But Jesus, like us, he knows our thoughts. He knew Simon's thoughts that day as well, and it that should have demonstrated to Simon that he was indeed a prophet. But it was in this context that Jesus taught the parable of the two debtors that day to this Pharisee. And we're going to learn some things tonight ourselves. Hopefully it'll help us to be more pure and more loving and more forgiving and compassionate. I want you to notice that there are three people in this story. There are two debtors and one creditor. One owed a debt of 50 pence. The other owed a debt of 500 pence. That's 10 times as much as the other. But both were in debt. Both were debtors. Both of them couldn't pay that debt. They were both in the same situation, although that Pharisee didn't see himself in that way. Jesus said the creditor forgave them both. You see, this woman and Simon are represented by the two debtors, and Jesus is represented by the creditor that forgave the debt that they could not pay. 
Jesus has forgiven us a debt that we could never pay in our own strength. And so the, the, the trap that so many of us get into is comparing ourselves with someone else. How, oh, we're, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm not like that one. I'm glad I'm not a, a sinner like that sinner. That's what this Pharisee was basically saying. He had invited all the rabbis of the day into his house, did a, a big dinner for Jesus, and was, uh, was shocked when this woman came into his house uninvited. She wasn't invited. She wasn't supposed to be there. But here she came in anyway. And uh, he was also shocked because Jesus didn't stop her. He let her continue on because he saw her heart. You see, Jesus asked the uh, Pharisee which one of the debtors would, would, the, would love the lender the most. Simon answered that the person who was forgiven the greater debt would love the most. Even he said, well, I suppose. <laughs> he knew. But this parable is a parable of great contrast. It's between two debtors. It's a, a contrast between the amount of the debt and the forgiveness of the debts, and it's a contrast between the gratitude of both. We often talk about this woman in the story as a sinner, and you know the Bible calls her a sinner twice, two different times. But the Pharisee was also a sinner. He just didn't know it. How many people are we surrounded by that think they got their stuff together and they're doing what they call good works and they think everything is cool because maybe they're not on the street corner? selling themselves or doing something crazy. But they're lost in the same way this woman was lost. A reality that none of us can save ourselves, that all of us need Jesus, really needs to sink in tonight with this parable that Jesus told to this Pharisee who thought he had his stuff all together. He was the talk of the town, inviting the, the man of the day, which was Jesus, the miracle worker in, who was in Nain in his town. He had just raised a boy from the dead. His mama was bringing the, daughter, the son around on the, the, the funeral pad, whatever they call it, the briar. And he touched him, and he was raised from the dead. That was in that town that had happened. And this was the town that happened. Here it is, the miracle worker. He invited him into his house, and Jesus came in. He went through those open doors. So many of us are afraid to walk through a door because it's uncomfortable. Maybe it's people that may not like us. Now, I don't think that that Pharisee had all good intentions when he brought Jesus in. There are many times when they surrounded themselves around Jesus, they really wanted to just catch him in something. They were trying to... Uh, trap him, and so, or just watch him to see if there's something they can catch him in, and that's what Simon did. He was watching him, and he had the wrong spirit. Here he had the Son of God in his house, and he could have received so much more, but he got a lesson that day, a beautiful lesson. There was something we need to notice about this very religious man. He was also a rude man. Some religious people can be very hard and rude and mean. <laughs> Does anybody? I don't, you know, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but to provide a guest with water to wash his dusty, sandaled feet was a common hospitality in the first century, and this man knew it. And he had everything probably spread out, but he neglected that with Jesus. So washing a guest's feet was actually an essential formality. And to not offer a guest water for the washing of his feet was not only rude, it was an insult of that day. And so if you remember the Last Supper when we taught about that, when we were going through the Gospel of John, how the disciples rushed to get the Last Supper together and none of them remembered about get, hiring the servant or getting arranging to have the foot washing. That was something that had to be done. And it wasn't done. And they all, just, before, just moments before that, were arguing about who was the greatest. If you remember, if you go back and study your Bible. And so what did Jesus do to illustrate how to be the greatest? Was he went and he got the towel. He pulled his, his outer garment off and he wrapped himself. And he went and got the bowl. And he washed his disciples' feet. And they said, oh, no. Peter said, no, you don't have to. Don't wash me, Lord. He says, if I don't wash you, you won't have any part of me. Then he says, wash my whole body. Peter always puts his foot in his mouth. But you got to love him, right? He makes us look good. <laughs> you got to love him. He shows you that even 
as, as uh, many times as he messed up, God still took him back in. That's hope for us, yeah. right? When we don't quite get it right all the time. So I think that's wonderful. But the fact that Simon did not extend the common courtesies to Jesus reveals that his wrong, he had wrong motives for inviting him into his home. So really, I've been studying this out and I haven't gotten the full meat of it. I thought it might be a sermon one day. I'm just going to give you a little glimpse of it. But Simon really violated what I call the law of honor. And there is such a thing, and I believe, although I haven't really found it in Scripture, I see a lot of references to honor. Whom you honor, I will God, I will God will honor. Jesus could do no mighty works in the town of Nazareth because uh, they didn't honor him as God's son, and they had unbelief. And so there is such a thing as violating the law of honor. And so I'm talking about honoring the Lord, of course, but also honoring, honoring those whom God sends. And uh, sometimes people get too free with their mouth, talking against people without thinking, letting the, the enemy fill their head and their hearts with the wrong words. And it's a trap. And they don't even realize they're walking into dangerous territory. But it is. It is dangerous territory. I mean, there's... We have to recognize that God wants us to be honorable. But Simon violated the law of honor. Judas violated the law of honor. He dishonored Jesus in so many ways, even before he betrayed him to the, to the Pharisees and got the 30 pieces of silver. He lived a life of stealing from the bag. He dishonored. It was, he violated. God, they expected him to do better. But he failed in that way. He was, you know, and there's a, there's a road you can go down and do it for a while, but you're just going to catch up with you. So it's important that you recognize that God wants to, um, God sees our heart. You're not fooling anybody. Hallelujah. I heard a story, I wasn't planning to tell this, but I heard a story about a church where the uh, father-in-law was the head usher in the church, and he, he seemed to be the nicest, most generous guy. Every time you turn around, he's buying something for somebody. Cadillac for this one, by paying off somebody's home for that one. And where did he get this money from? Well, months went by. After a while, he got something happened to him, and he could not uh, be a help in the, in the uf- ushering because of his health or something. So he, and they were surprised at how much more the offerings were in the church. All of a sudden, it's like they quadrupled. Where is all this? All of a sudden, we got such an increase of money. Turns out the father-in-law was pilfering from the church and thought he was doing a good deed and he was buying stuff for people. And so they had to, of course, reprimand him and remove him from that. But you just never know what's going on. We don't know people's hearts. And we're not, like I talked about earlier uh, when we talked about the parable of the tares, God's not calling us to be the big inspector. We just got to stay on our road, stay in our lane and do what God's calling us to do and make sure our hearts are pure knowing that the enemy is forever at work to try to pull us off track and violate the law of honor. If we stay honorable before God, he's going to keep us in the right way. Amen. But Simon violated that law of honor. But, and Simon's minimal, he just did very, he, hospitality is contrasted with this woman's lavish devotion. She poured it on. I'm talking about high, extreme praise, extreme praise. Extreme worship, crazy praise, if you want to call it that. She didn't care who was watching her, right? She just gave her whole heart to God. That was so powerful, and it was amazing. The love that she displayed was the fruit of a penitent heart. She, was, she had fully repented, and... Uh, that's what she was doing that day. Her heart was just so full, it was pouring out. She didn't care if they would pull her away. She is like, I mean, I love these kind of women. I love these kind of people that just press on and get in the face of people. Like that woman that had the issue of blood. She just said, if I just touch him, I know that I'm going to be healed. I'm just going to press in. Well, this woman knew, I knew she had probably encountered Jesus somewhere along the road. She may have heard his message. She may have seen him forgive someone else. Who knows? I mean, we don't have the detail of how she got to know Jesus. But she had encountered him in such a way that she was so transformed that she heard he was in that house. And she was determined to go and bring him her best and pour out her whole life to him. 
She walked through that, that difficult place. She had, talk about courage. She didn't care with those people. They could have threw her out. She'd probably been thrown out of places before. It wasn't new. God is looking for people that are bold enough to just express their love for him, their compassion for what he's compassionate about, their love for what he loves. Amen? Amen. And so she was in that house that day, and she brought her best, and she met, found him, and they were, he was reclining. And here it is, she's pouring it out and kissing her. Now, I can't imagine kissing anybody's feet. I'm just going to say, that's a hard one to swallow. But talk about, any, I mean, that's a whole nother level of devotion. So she washed him, and, and it was her, his feet were precious. The Bible talks about precious are the feet of those that bring the good news. Right? Beautiful feet, I think it says. Beautiful feet. So this woman was like very few. And so God, Jesus told, took this opportunity to tell the story of her and the Pharisee and compare them so that we can see how we need to guard our own heart. And also greeting a guest with a kiss and all for his oil for his head were signs of warmth and friendliness, which the Simon didn't do any of that. But this woman washed, not only washed his feet, but she put, she was kissing them. And it took an uninvited, sinful woman to show hospitality to Jesus in this Pharisee's home. At some point, she had to have believed in him. And uh, it just revealed the desperation that she sought forgiveness from Jesus. And her weeping was an expression of deep repentance. Her tears showed that the old life had ended and her new life had begun. Amen. Don't you just love it when you see someone come to the Lord? It's just like nothing else. I remember when we'd have altar calls, there's many altar calls we've had when I've seen people come forward in a way that I know they'd never been in church. Because they come forward, instead of facing the, the front, they'll come and face everybody. They do like this. Like they're, you can tell like they're in church for the first time. You know what I'm talking about. But isn't that precious? And it's, there's nothing. And we should always rejoice when we see those kind of things. And um, because they're, they're pure and they're, they're hungry for God. But these tears showed that this old life ended, that she had. And she knew she had found something that was precious. See, when Jesus told this parable about the one that was forgiven much and one that had been forgiven little, he asked Simon which of them would love him most. Mm. Simon answered rightly, the one who had been forgiven much. You know, my husband would say, Kathy, you didn't have nothing to repent. You didn't have nothing to give up, you know, when I got born again. And he always would give me a hard time because when I got born again, I wasn't living the life like he was. But I had a, I don't know, I'm thankful for that. I had a, a, an awareness that it wasn't the things that, that, that was the difference so much as my heart. And my heart was so uh, stony and so cold and all of a sudden, when I encountered him, I totally changed. I, it, did, it wasn't about what I had to give up. It's what I gained. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? So I'm sure this woman that was the sinner wasn't thinking about, oh, I can't go walk the streets anymore. She's talking about, I, I'm really free now. I'm really free. I, can, I, I feel love for the first time. Maybe she was looking for love, like they say, in all the wrong places. But here she is. She encountered Jesus and really knew love for the very first time. This is, should be our message, that our lives should be such, lived in such a way that when, when we talk to people about Jesus, they feel the love that we have from, for him coming out of our hearts, out of our lives, so much that it makes them hungry and thirsty for God. The Bible tells us that we're to be the salt of the earth. Yes. Salt makes you thirsty. When you walk around people, and it does a lot of things, of course, it preserves, it makes things taste good. We like flavor around here. But it also makes you thirsty. So we should be, live our lives in such a way. And what I mean by this is that we should show our, uh, our love for God, but also our appreciation for all that he's done for us. This is what worship's all about. Lord, we worship you because of all that you've, not for what I've done, but because of what you've done. Amen? And it, Amen. it is the only way to serve him. And it transforms you. It helps you to, 
to be what he's called you to be. Luke, uh, verse 47 and 48, I want to read that again. It says, wherefore I say unto thee, this is what Jesus told the woman. I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. I remember that when I first realized that my sins were forgiven. My sins, I thought, well, what, my sin of not having him in my heart, not, my sin of, of living my own life, my sin of not even thinking about him, but real, thinking that I can live life on my own. But my awareness that he, he came to live inside of me transformed me so much that when I, when I got born again, I couldn't wait to get, get in the presence of God every moment that I could. Went to church when I could, and I remember uh, wanting everybody else to get saved. So this unnamed woman came to that dinner party to express her appreciation for Jesus, and she received a perfect pardon. And Jesus told her to go in peace. That's in verse 50. And he said unto the woman, thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Hallelujah. Think about that. That your faith, your faith hath saved thee. This word saved is sozo, and it means to save, to heal, to cure, to preserve. Sounds salty to me. Keep safe and sound. Rescue from danger or destruction or deliver. This is an all-inclusive word. The salvation that he talk, we talk about, it's not just eternal home. It's not just fire insurance, as they say. You know, you'll miss hell. No, and make heaven. No, it's, it's a life eternal that begins the moment you, that you say, Jesus, come into my life. And this sozo saves from physical death by healing and from spiritual death by forgiving sin and its effects. And even in primitive cultures, this word is translated is simply means to give new life and to cause to have a new heart. This woman had a new heart. You know she had to have been a cynical woman, had seen a lot of uh, bad uh, situations, been in difficult situations, had resorted to that kind of a life. But here she could forgive herself. And that's the beauty of knowing Jesus. When you know him and you know that he loves you, you're able to forgive yourself. No matter where you messed up along the way, the, the debt that you owed, you could not pay. The Pharisee is as right as he tried to be, follow every law. He, even no matter if he, he could never file, follow all of the law and keep everything right. You could tell he couldn't by his heart because he was saying, huh, look at that son of Jesus. If he was a prophet, he'd know who she is. He ought to know that. And here he knew her, Jesus knew this man's thoughts. And, and corrected the situation with such love and mercy. Instead of just jumping on his case, he says, I got to tell you a story. And sometimes that's the, the most beautiful way that he taught people. Instead of just jumping down their throat or just telling the truth uh, that he wanted them to know, he told them a story that illustrated the truth. And that's the story of this one parable, the first parable in the Gospel of Luke, one of 19 unique parables that Luke wrote about out of the 35 that he shares in the whole, chap the whole gospel, the longest chap gospel uh, uh, book, gospel in there. I don't know if it's the whole gospel of the longest book, the longest book in the New Testament. So this is what he, what happened that he told this one, this was the one to start with, to remind us that, um, no matter what we've done in life, we all need a savior. And that's why we should be merciful and compassionate to others that are around us. Maybe they just have, you know, this was my prayer every time when I'd see, when I was praying for my husband to be born again. And I, and I would see some of the things that he was doing that would, the enemy would want to tell me, he's never going to get born again. You see what he did yesterday. You see what he did tonight. You know, you, I mean, you, it would replay. But I, my, my answer to that was always so, Beautiful, and I, I have to say it's the grace of God that God put it in my heart because I always would answer, well, the only reason he's doing that is because he doesn't know Jesus. And it made it so easy for me to just forgive him. And I'm telling you, he did some pretty nasty stuff. But I don't want y'all to think about that. But it's the truth. He'll tell you too. 
But it was so much when I realized that knowing Jesus makes all the difference. It will give you the ability to be merciful and be merciful and kind to someone who's not getting it right. And I'm not saying that you should let yourself be abused. Um, this, pe some people take it too far. And I'm talking about, I wasn't in an abusive situation physically. I mean, I didn't suffer for anything. I had what I needed. Uh, but he was, I was neglected and he did some things immorally and there was some drugs issues and all that. But there was a lot going on before we knew Jesus. This, I, before I knew Jesus, even though I wasn't doing that, I was going to the same place he was going. And that's what I told him when he said, Kathy, you don't have anything to, to give up. I said, but I was going to the same place you're going right now. And I was relentless in his face preaching at him. Before I knew I could preach, I was, he was my congregation. And, you know, and it wasn't things I heard someone else say. I knew it in my heart. The Holy Spirit gave me the words to say that he needed. And in the same way, when God puts someone in our path that we're assigned to, because I'm telling you, all of us are assigned to somebody. What a waste of salvation if it was just for you. Wasn't that a selfish way to live? <laughs> anyway, but uh, God gives you someone in your path that you're, you're, to call, you're to intercede for, to stand in the gap for. You know, and uh, it can't just be somebody over there in China. It's got to be somebody that's in your face that you're gonna <laughs> that you're gonna talk to, right? Amen. I'm telling you, Jesus knew wants us to know that this is where the rubber meets the road. Right. If we can't live for Him in this way, really, we we have a we have a, a counterfeit that we've been entertaining for too long. We have to realize we have to have a pure heart before Him and walk in forgiveness. And it's a day-to-day -day struggle, I'm telling you. You gotta have to, the enemy's always trying to plant seeds in there. We have to keep a clean heart and recognize when the, the enemy comes yeah. to, to attack so that we can put him in his place. Right. And we can do that. But the, the bottom line is, is that when we realize that, um, that all of us are in the same boat, I think I explained it, uh, when people, a while, a few lessons back, I forget which one it was, talking about how people wanted to take off and swim to Hawaii, and they were people of all different strengths and, and uh, ages and fitness levels, and some of them felt like they, they had it all together and they could make it, but nobody can make it to Hawaii. I don't care how strong you think you are, you're not gonna make it to Hawaii. Swimming, right? You need... You, nobody can fit in the same way. No, none of us can ever make heaven our home. So the Pharisee, as much Simon, as much as, as much as he thought he had it all together, he needed to be forgiven as well. And so the whole concept of how we all need forgiveness is ground zero Christianity. And when we recognize that, then it changes our perspective when we connect with other people. Do y'all get that? And so it's so important that we get this one parable. Next week, I'm going to be teaching on the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is also in the book of Luke. And I, I'm, I'm preparing that, but it's, it's going to be so powerful and strong. But each time when we meet, we're going to tell a different story with a strong meaning. Sometimes we'll tell more than one. You remember that we've only had, this is the fourth lesson, and we've taught eight of them from one chapter that we covered already. So... We're going somewhere. We're learning what Jesus taught the people, what he wanted them to know, and it was recorded because he wants us to know it. And these types of things about knowing that God forgives will help us to realize that he's calling us to bring his message to others that are in our path. Because there are people around us that think that they could never be forgiven. This woman was a sinner. It calls her a sinner twice. Yeah, he re you were, and he said, but he forgave, but she was repentant. She came there because of her uh, heart was already uh, repentant and she uh, gave of her heart and was not ashamed to show that she loved him and cared for him and wanted to do something to honor him. Why? Because he wasn't honored in that house. See, God will get his honor. You may not do it. That Pharisee did not do it. But I'm telling you what, God had that woman right there where she needed to be to honor his son while he was on the earth. I want to be one of those that I will always honor him and glorify him and not be, God say, oh, put her, I got to bring somebody else in because Kathy didn't step up to the plate. There got to be time when we just know we step up to the plate and we do kingdom business. Amen. 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 
and quit making excuses for it. It's time for us to grow up as a church and realize that God has strategically placed us right here with a divine mission. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, that's good preaching, Sister Kathy. A divine mission to, to be a reflection of Jesus, be the salt of the earth. Amen. Be, let the light of God flow through us and, not, and, and guard our hearts so we don't step into that condemnation lane because that's real easy to slip into. Think, oh, you know, I'm glad I'm not like her. I'm glad I'm not like him. Remember that, the, uh, the Pharisee the, or the, the rich man or that was looking up into heaven and, oh, he was praying. He says, I'm glad I'm not like that Pharisee. Yeah. Oh, how did I, I'm getting it all mixed up. But the, fair, the, the oh, the, the, the uh, it was the, was it the leper? The man, he, the man that had leprosy, I think he says, oh, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. He didn't look up to himself. I wouldn't, y'all know what I'm talking about. But there, we have to make sure that we're, we're pure before God and, and trust him. Every time we come before him, we should be thankful for all that he's already done for us. Amen? And, and give him glory and honor for that. Praise God. Let me say that. Amen. You see, when you have true faith, it will always produce love. That's what it's, Jesus told this woman. He says, your faith hath saved you. When you have true faith, you will always produce love. And when you have true love, it will always result in service. You see, the natural outgrow of a man or a woman in love with Jesus is an intense desire to serve him. This woman had an intense desire to serve him by pouring out that, that, that alabaster jar, by wipe, crying and wiping her ha- his uh, feet with her tears and her hair. That was to serve him because she was being led by God to do it because it wasn't being done right there. But when we serve Jesus by serving others, it brings glory to him. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Would you bow your heads? Father, I'm so thankful that we can hear your heart tonight. Lord, I thank you that you're showing us just how precious every soul is in this world. Lord, we want to cry out for them and that they would know you the way we do, Lord. So right now, Lord, we just pray for the lost, all those in this area that don't know you, all the family members that are actually represented in this house. Maybe there are people in here that are crying out for their lost family members. Maybe some lost people that they know that are at work. And Lord, if we haven't been crying out for them enough, please forgive us and help us to know that this is one assignment that we can't shrink back from. But Lord, I thank you that when we stand in the gap for people and lift them up, that you can save them, you can reach them, you can touch them. Lord, we send angels out. We send laborers across the path of those that are not born again, that, that are family members of this congregation. Lord, that are workers, co-workers of people in this congregation. Lord, we pray for the lost to come in. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that they can find refuge here. They can find peace and safety here in this house. Lord, that they'll come here and get to know you and know your word in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray this. And Lord, pray we call all of us, Lord, together to be soul winners. Lord, I pray for all the soul winners that'll be working pretty soon. Even this Saturday, Lord, they're going to go out into the highways and the byways. They're going to go out to, to reach those that many, many of them may not have ever heard the name of Jesus or may not even know you the way we know you. Lord, I pray for an empowerment for every person that'll be working in that soul winning outreach this Saturday, Lord, that you will touch each and every one of them and strengthen them, anoint them, Lord. Lord, that your love would flow from them and through them and they would instead of and that they would be an expression of your love and compassion to those that have a need in their life, whatever those needs may be. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we're anointed to carry your message to those that are lost. I thank you that every person in this room tonight are, is anointed by the Holy Spirit to carry the message of the gospel in such a way that it will bring uh, what is needed at the time. Lord, I thank you for that. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.